Okay, we turn now to a panel, again, at the risk of playing favorites. I have been anticipating since we began planning this, con uh, this conference uh, because uh, the only thing I uh, have any academic background in really is uh, prag American pragmatism. Um, uh, and uh, we almost, I don't know if Randy knows this, uh, my teacher Hillary Putnam was almost here, but <laughs> uh, he couldn't come down, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so, Kaplan and the Philosophers. Um, Rabbi Dr. Alan Nadler uh, sends his apologies. So, his paper on um, Spinoza, contrary to popular belief, has not been excommunicated, but uh, he will be here later this afternoon. It actually works out well because we'll, um, we'll give this panel more space and time to operate. So, without further ado, uh, Dr. Alan Skult. Well, my name is Alan Skult. I am Mel Skult's brother, but that's not the primary reason why I'm up here. Um, uh, I also work in philosophy. I'm a, a teacher and writer of philosophy and the relationship between uh, certain uh, German philosophers and uh, Jewish thought. Um, and uh, my uh, work as a philosopher uh, and Mel's work on Kaplan has added a very interesting dimension to our relationship, which has always been interesting. I can't tell you how many times he has called me excited, and I think you've seen what happens to Mel when he gets excited, uh, about a new discovery, often gleaned from his reading of the diaries, which as he told you, I, I, I think in yesterday's talk, he reads every day, faithfully, like Shacharit. Um, uh, discoveries he gleans from the diary about Another connection, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, uh, between Kaplan's thought and the philosophers that Kaplan was endlessly reading. Um, and very often I had to get the book that uh, Kaplan was reading. Very often they were out of print uh, so that Mel and I could both be reading what Kaplan was reading so we could talk about it. Uh, which is a hermeneutical exercise of the first order. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful way to study Kaplan as a philosopher. And what I got from that experience, and I feel this very, very, very strongly, uh, and Dan, we need another conference specifically focused on Kaplan as philosopher. Uh, because based on, on, on Mel's and my conversation, I can assure you that there is much philosophy in Kaplan uh, to be unearthed, to be studied, to be pursued, to be conversed about. Um, but Kaplan, of course, was not a philosopher. Uh, he was busy doing other things, like saving the Jewish people. Um, and philosophy requires um, a sustained meditative dwelling, as Heidegger put it. Uh, with the philosophers who make up the tradition. And Kaplan simply didn't have the time and the zitz place for that. He was doing too many other things. Philosophers don't do primarily. I mean, they think, they write, they read. Um, but the ideas of the philosophers that he was reading um, informed his thought and his teaching. Um, for example, one of the philosophers was uh, Ernest Hocking, and uh, uh, he had a student spy Hocking. Uh, when he was reading Dewey, uh, he had a student spy Dewey so that they could study and read uh, the philosopher together. So we could say that um, there was an ongoing conversation, which is a very important word in, in, in philosophy, for me at least, an ongoing conversation um, not overt, but sort of covert and implicit, uh, that Kaplan conducted with the philosophers that he read. And bits and pieces of this conversation, of this ongoing conversation, are recorded in the diary. Um, and the bits and pieces are quite extraordinary philosophical fragments. Some of you might know uh, 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 Friedrich Schlegel, uh, 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 a philosopher um, uh, in, the, in the early 19th century who wrote a book called Philosophical Fragments. And I think that there are bits and pieces of 
uh, philosophy in Kaplan's diaries especially, which could be published alone as philosophical fragments, and I think that they would be quite informative and interesting to talk about. But none of them are uh, developed into sustained philosophical thought. Uh, Kaplan did not write as a philosopher. Um, and so the philosophy in his thinking remains hidden for the most part. Um, and, 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 and Kaplan, as a philosophical thinker, remains very, very much underestimated. And I'm so happy about this panel this morning because this is the beginning. I don't know if there's been any other panel in any conference on Kaplan and philosophy. Um, is the beginning of, of Kaplan's emergence as, I think, the very important uh, uh, thinker that he was. Uh, one of the virtues of, of, of Mel's latest book, um, uh, The Radical American Judaism of Mordecai Kaplan, is that he brings a lot of um, the philosophical themes that are implicit in uh, the diaries and in other places, and he brings them together and makes them part of, and shows us how they are, they are a part of uh, the organic development of, of, of Kaplan's thought. Um, and uh, gives us a, a very, very rich resource uh, to continue to develop. Um, and um, so I'm very happy to introduce uh, this panel uh, as a way of continuing uh, Kaplan's conversation with the philosophers um, that is found in, in um, uh, the diary for the most part, but also in Mel's books and, and some other places. Um, and uh, as, as Dan said, um, Kaplan and Spinoza will wait until uh, this afternoon. And um, what we have this morning, um, what did I do here? Ah, um, is uh, Dr. Randy uh, Friedman on Kaplan and American Pragmatism. Uh, Randy is from the State University of New York at Binghamton, followed by Dr. George Yako Kohler on Kaplan and Herman Cohen uh, from Bar Ilan, uh, and then there's Catherine um, uh, Madsen uh, on Kaplan and Levinas, uh, and she's from the Yiddish Book Center. E even these topics, and, and look how far apart in time uh, these philosophers are, give you some feeling as to the range of possibilities of thinking philosophy with Kaplan. Um, so we'll begin with Randy Friedman on Kaplan and philosophical pragmatism. America. Good morning. Since we're being web broadcast, I'll uh, take advantage of something that I've always wanted to say at the beginning of a talk, and that is, um, hi, mom. <laughs> such nachis, such nachis. Hi, mom. She's quelling. The influence of classical American philosophy on Mordechai Menachem Kaplan's reconstruction of Judaism is well known. In this paper, I'll focus on a critical distinction in the works of John Dewey and William James to tease out a better understanding of the genealogy and to focus on the conception of experience in Kaplan's thought. The similarities between Dewey and Kaplan's notions of reconstruction are striking. Though there's a good bit of debate surrounding this branch of the American pragmatic family tree, Kaplan can be read as an inheritor specifically of Deweyan pragmatism. Much of this disagreement centers on Kaplan's brand of pragmatism. Does it share as much with William James as it does with John Dewey? I'd make the argument that it's very helpful to read Kaplan uh, after Dewey, and I'll try to make that case today. Kaplan's groundbreaking work in modern Judaic thought sought to reorient Judaism in much the same way that Dewey sought to challenge and to redirect philosophy. And in his lectures, specifically, Quest for Certainty in a Common Faith, to reconstruct certain categories of religion, or as he puts it, to translate religion 
into the religious dimension of experience. Kaplan and Dewey share a belief in the value and function of the community at the heart of a pluralistic society, and both appreciate the function of religion freed from the weight of supernaturalism, mythology, and dogma. Kaplan's philosophy of religion is pragmatic in the Deweyan sense of judging beliefs as true by looking to their value in and through experience, which is itself shaped by and which shapes the life of the community. Kaplan also shares with Dewey a functionalist pragmatism which emphasizes the utility of certain beliefs and ideals at the level of community. Following Dewey, Kaplan understands truths to be more akin to hypotheses than fixed principles whose authority lies beyond the horizon of the past and so beyond reconstruction or revaluation. Three themes of Kaplan's pragmatic and functionalist theology stand out. The first deals with the traditional notion of truth often expressed in religious traditions as a fixed principle linked with the past and particular sacred texts. For the pragmatists, truth is best understood as an adjective that describes an idea or a practice that works. Unanchoring a tradition from its past or from the authority of the past is itself a tradition which dates back to, dates back to Emerson's American Scholar Lecture and the Divinity School Address. The future is seen as the leading horizon, determining our present more than the past does or should. The second theme is compound. Kaplan recenters authority in our present experience. Like Emerson, Kaplan urges an unmediated, unmediated appreciation of the right of the individual to determine the meaning and the force of her obligations. Like Dewey, he does not only turn to individual experiences, but to the needs and the demands of the community to flesh out the possibilities of the present. This, I think, is a critical distinction with William James. Finally, Kaplan argues for a thoroughly naturalistic understanding of what he calls the God idea, that is, a metaphysical, but decidedly not supernatural God, one that bears with it value, but is not an independent or transcendent being. Through all of this, Kaplan and Dewey share a functionalist understanding of the central categories of religion that focus on their dynamic, pluralistic, or democratic possibilities, not experience of, but experience that does, or in Dewey's words, spirituality of the possible, not, or spirituality of the possible, not spirituality of the actual. Like Kaplan, Dewey has no patience for the supernatural or any fixed and permanent ideas, so often the core of both traditional philosophical metaphysics and organized religion. Instead, both he and Kaplan turn to an empirical and experimental philosophy which seeks to develop the ability of individuals and groups to appreciate, develop, and reflect the ethical ideals of democratic society. Both Dewey and Kaplan find great value in the re reconstruction or recovery of the basic function of the metaphysical, that is, the communal generation and nurturing of ideals which sustain and, and direct democratic culture. If this works, I'm going to take a couple of slides to review a quick primer of uh, pragmatism and how it relates to religion. We'll see if any of my daughter's sparkles and flames show up while I turn the slides. Hopefully not. So in the pragmatic reconstruction of religion, I could identify five perhaps helpful characteristics. The first would be religion without the supernatural, though there's a question about that with James. The second would be a turn to religious experience instead of a dependence upon dogma and the authority of religion, traditional religion. The third would be that it is always forward-looking, that the horizon of the future sets its course. The fourth would be that ideas and beliefs are judged as true through experience and not on the basis of their origin or their divine origin in most cases. And the fifth would be that the meaning and value of experiences is neither static nor fixed, that it can change, over, it change and should change over time. James defines religion uh, as, he says, the feelings, acts, and experiences of individuals in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. In his lectures published as A Common Faith, Dewey's definition is decidedly different. Dewey describes, he says, suppose for the moment that the word God means the ideal ends that at a given time and place one acknowledges as having authority over her volition and emotion, the values to which one is supremely devoted, 
as far as these ends through imagination take on unity. If we make this supposition, the issue will stand out clearly in contrast with the doctrine of religions that God designates some kind of being having prior and therefore non-ideal existence. So we think of varieties of naturalized theology. James, on the one hand, turns to the individual, an individual experience almost alone. And for Dewey, and I think for Kaplan, the turn is to uh, experience understood in a much broader and I, I think a much more uh, fruitful way. So I created a flow chart. I'm not sure why. Uh, the theological distinction between a supernatural and a naturalistic conception of the God, the supernatural leads to speculation about God's characteristics, the omnis. I think there are five, though a sixth might recently have been added. Uh, God is thought of as a creator, as a judge, and more often than not, the God that is lectured about or preached about is always right. There are very few times you go to synagogue and someone says, I've thought about it, and actually we've been getting it wrong. God was wrong here. And when you look at a naturalistic theology, religion is translated through human experience. For James, it's between the individual and that which he takes to be the divine. For Dewey, however, and for Kaplan, it's the individual in relation to the community. Both James and Dewey claim to be pluralistic. James is pluralistic because there are a variety of religious experiences. Dewey is pluralistic because he does not appeal to an experience of something that might be metaphysically or ontologically real. I'll keep this on and keep going. Dewey distinguishes himself from James over a technical but crucial difference in their notions of truth and divinity. Dewey identifies two working notions of truth in James, ideas as ideas and ideas as truths. The first deals with ideas as ideas. The truth of an idea is discovered as it sets about working through the stream of experience. In other words, Dewey writes, and I'll skip down, this is the first quote, when then it's a question of an idea, it's the idea itself which is practical, and its meaning resides in the existences which as changed it intends, which is I think how Kaplan would describe a religious belief in its function. Dewey's point is that the meaning and the truth value of an idea are, are tied to its practical consequences but are not exhausted by them. In Dewey's description, we find hints of the social or communal aspects of his philosophy. An idea is set at play upon existing things and affects other existing things which must rearrange or readjust themselves. It's the social force of an idea. In this sense, the truth of an idea reverberates influencing other ideas and concepts and theories as it works out its meaning in the world. Or better still, the meaning of an idea is found by looking forward through its reverberations in its expanding circles of influence and interrelation. Circles, of course, a reference to Emerson. The second formula for truth or, me or meaning Dewey identifies in James is more problematic. It, it deals with ideas as truths. In the second kind of truth, uh, the meaning of an idea is already assumed or pre-given. And so the quote, it's in, and I think I can cut the quote down, but for the first, ideas as working hypotheses, Dewey emphasizes their meaning as programs of behavior for modifying the existent world. For some ideas, then, Dewey writes, it's difficult to see how the pragmatic method could possibly be applied. It seems unpragmatic for pragmatism to content itself with finding out the value of a conception whose own inherent intellectual significance pragmatism has not first determined by treating it not at all as a truth, but simply as a working hypothesis and method. This is a central tenet of Kaplan's approach to Judaism, and we might, in fact, consider it to be a first statement of his methodology. And this marks the break between James and Dewey. Dewey makes this explicit when he handles a passage in James where James writes, the notion of God which guarantees an ideal order that shall be permanently preserved. Dewey's reaction is worth citing at length because after I cite it at length, we can get back to Kaplan. Dewey's disagreement with James over his suggested understanding of God runs this discussion through the two, of the two types of truth into the divide between James' supernaturalism and Kaplan and Dewey's naturalism. Dewey asks, this is the question for James, is it the object God has defined or the notion or the belief which affects these consequent values? And either of the latter alternatives, the good or valuable consequence cannot clarify the meaning or conception of God.
for by the argument they proceed from a prior definition of God, hence the need for constant revaluation and reconstruction. Religious experience can turn towards dogmatism, which allows or proves the fixed idea or the fixed notion of an idea or belief, such as faith in God's existence. Dewey rejects James, I argue, because most often religious experience simply confirms a pre-existing concept or idea about the world without revaluing it or reconstructing it. There's another kind of religious faith which is attractive to Dewey and Kaplan, and it's what Dewey terms moral faith. He writes, apart from any theological context, there's a difference between belief, that is a conviction, that some end should be supreme over conduct, and belief that some object or being exists as a truth for the intellect. Conviction in the moral sense uh, signifies being conquered, vanquished in our active nature by an ideal end. Such acknowledgement is practical, not primarily intellectual. The authority of an ideal over choice and conduct is the authority of an ideal, not of a fact, not of a truth guaranteed to the intellect, not of the status of the one who propounds the truth. Because we're running, running much shorter on time than as I practiced, I'll skip quickly towards the end. Kaplan fits in a line of American thinkers who are anti-dogmatic and anti-dualistic. And yet the folks I have in mind, specifically Emerson and Dewey, find more than enough room to fit moral ideals and moral inspiration into their naturalized conceptions of the religious. James, in this case, is the odd one out with his talk of the wider self and waves from the mother sea washing over consciousness. Dewey retains the spirit of the metaphysical through a recovery of its function, not the object of its attention or, God forbid, the supernatural origin of the experience. He's more naturalistic than James. Dewey's pragmatic naturalism thrives on the moral sentiment he finds at the core of the democratic culture his pragmatism serves. Pragmatism, by ridding philosophy of the weight of the metaphysical, allows poetry and religious feeling to be the unforced flowers of life. And I'll conclude with two quotes, one of which was already mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, and the two quotes, you'll have to guess which one comes from Dewey and which one comes from Kaplan. The first quote is that poetry, art, and religion are precious things. They cannot be maintained by lingering in the past and futilely wishing to restore what the movement of events in science, industry, and politics has destroyed. They're an outflowering of thought and desires that unconsciously converge into a disposition of imagination as a result of thousands and thousands of daily episodes and conduct. They cannot be willed into existence or coerced into being. The wind of the spirit bloweth where it listeth, and the kingdom of God in such things does not come with observation. But while it's impossible to retain and recover by deliberate volition old sources of religion and art that have been discredited, it is possible to expedite the development of the vital sources of a religion and art that are yet to be. And the last quote is, aesthetic experience essentially involves a perception of meaning and significance that adds to the value of life. It's a sort of revelation of value, of a spiritual quality or divine aspect in things. To produce art is to give new meaning to reality. Since the experience of value in life constitutes our knowledge of God, all sincere art is sacred in the past. Religion emphasized the beauty of holiness. Modern religion must also emphasize the holiness of beauty. Thank you. Should we, should we take a guess at which one is which one is Kaplan and which one is Dewey? The blue is Kaplan and the uh, maroon is Dewey. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I uh, have to apologize for a small change in my subject. Um, I, I, when I was talking to people last two days, actually, I, to I told them that I was talking about Hermann Cohen, and everybody was going, who's that? So I said, uh, it's Hermann Cohen. So everybody said, ah, yes, I know him. Okay, so, so I'm talking about Hermann Cohen, <laughs> a German, German Jewish philosopher, <laughs> Uh, living from 1842 until 1980. Hermann Cohen, okay, I'm trying to practice this. Hermann Cohen uh, deserves to be known better for a number of reasons. 
Mordechai Kaplan wrote as late as 1964. And as a result of this challenge, uh, he wrote a 300 pages book, which is called The Purpose and the Meaning of Jewish Existence. Kaplan's um, volume um, consisted of three parts, a long philosophical introduction to the thought of Hermann Kohn, um, and, you know, of course, uh, pointing out the differences to its own Kaplan thought, an English paraphrase, or, or as he, Kaplan himself called this, an epitome of uh, Cohen's last and influential work, uh, The Religion of Reason Out of the Sources of Judaism, from 1918, and Kaplan's own commentary on the selection of Cohen's ideas presented in this epitome. Now, the commentary is uh, very short and explanatory, but sometimes um, it could also be very long and rich in thought, and this is especially at those point, points where Kaplan has to voice harsh criticism of uh, Hermann Kohn, or of what he selected, at least from Kohn's book. Unfortunately, uh, Kaplan's book on Kohn did not receive the attention it surely deserves, and this is for two reasons. Um, first reason, only eight years later, a very, very good full English translation of Herman Cohn's last book was published, introduced by Leo Strauss, and of course this you know, full translation shaped the English language discussion of Herman Cohn further on, and unfortunately not Kaplan's you know, shorter paraphrase. Uh, uh, and the second reason is that you know, the interest in the Jewish public, uh, of the Jewish public in Herman Cohn always remained very scarce. Cohen has not the privilege of having this you know, large movement behind him as, as in the case of uh, uh, Kaplan. Uh, the orthodox thinker Isaac, Isaac Breuer, Cohen's uh, contemporary, once pointed out that um, actually what will remain from Cohen, you know, Breuer prophesies that uh, um, Cohen has founded a Jewish sect, the sect of the atheists. And this sect will share the same fate as the sect that another Jewish thinker founded 2,000 years earlier, you know, the Christian Jews, you know, Jewish Christians. So um, I think there is something to it, you know, to uh, uh, Breuer's prophecy and also Kaplan himself in a way shared this uh, concern for the future existence of the Jewish people should the Jews follow the advice of Hermann Kohn. In this talk, I will first uh, present Kaplan's overall critique of the religious philosophy of Hermann Kohn, of course, from the point of view of a member of the sect of the ethicists, and uh, then I will turn to a very striking example, uh, um, the answer that both thinkers give to the question, why did the Jewish people survive for thousands of years? Uh, we'll first have to note that Kaplan did not seem to have many information on Cohen's life and public activities beyond Cohen's actual books and articles. The only source mentioned is moreover a highly problematic one, Franz Rosenzweig's introduction to Cohen's Jewish writings, published in 1924, uh, six years after Cohen's death. This text is in fact a collection of very dubious anecdotes about Cohn, more intended to present the Cohn that Rosenzweig would have liked him to be than the real Cohn. <laughs> and uh, this essay by, by Rosenzweig caused much harm to the reception of the thought of Hermann Cohn, and Kaplan, unfortunately, is no exception here. So Kaplan's own philosophical essay on Hermann Cohn's theology of Judaism has a strange but very consistent form of presenting the argument. Kaplan at many places first offered severe criticism of Hermann Cohn only to follow this up with a new assertion that contradicts the former critique almost completely. Okay, so here are a few examples of this uh, method. First, Cohn's view on Jewish messianism. One of his uh, most important theological ideas. First, Kaplan uh, claimed critically Cohn's religion of reason was intended for those who saw, I quote, in the German version of democratic socialism a more meaningful idea than in Jewish messianism, unquote. But later Kaplan conceded that what Cohn really did was to read the socialist ideal into Jewish messianism and what is more by seeing a rational connection between Jewish monotheism and messianism, and then by equating messianism with socialism, Kohn, quote again, returned to Judaism, as Kaplan writes. Another instance of uh, Kaplan's interesting um, rejection but approach to Kohn is found in what Kaplan likes to call the forms of Jewish existence, meaning his interest in the daily communal life of Judaism as, a, as opposed to the philosophical interest in Judaism um, Judaism's, Judaism's fundamental but very, very abstract ideas and concepts. Here, Cohen is 
rightly accused of concentrating on constructing a new philosophical rational for Judaism in modernity after the pre-modern traditional intuitive Jewish way of life has broken off. For Kaplan, however, priority must be given to, and I quote again, the specific form and the objective validation of Jewish existence, unquote, under the completely changed circumstances of modernity. But Cohen, Kaplan wrote, viewed life from an ivory tower. The ivory tower of idealism. Cohen moves from one hypothesis to the next, from one generalization to the next, and refused to observe the data of reality. Kaplan writes, today we know that nothing could be farther from truth, actually, at least when it comes to Cohen's personal life. Um, the German professor was at the top of a list of available speakers uh, for um, public events organized by Jewish organizations against uh, anti-Semitism at his time. We know that Cohen traveled at the age of 72, 1914, traveled to Russia personally, the old Cohen, the old man, to, in order to help persecuted Russian Jewry. Cohen knew well that the data of German reality did not match his ideal of German culture, which could not deter him from formulating ideal demands. You know, but if Kaplan was aware of this or not, here again, he is eventually forced to admit that at least Cohen's mature thought on Judaism, I quote, attached spiritual significance to the need for the Jews to maintain, maintain their communal separateness, end of quote. And that specifically his last book, Cohen's last book, The Religion of Reason, comes to convince the Jew that he, I quote again from Kaplan, that he ought to remain loyal to Judaism. Which, of course, you know, unquote, which, of course, uh, uh, for Cohen is always meant in very, very practical terms to be loyal to Judaism. Nevertheless, the true, um, this, this, all this, what I said, is true only for the time being. The most Fundamental difference that Kaplan saw between his own thought and that of Hermann Cohen concerns the future of Judaism. Here now, we find no but anymore. Okay? Um, at this stage, Kaplan is very convinced um, there are ways part. Cohen's universal interpretation of prophetic messianism leads him to the point where Judaism would eventually disappear in world history, and make room for what Cohen often called the idea of a unified mankind. For Kaplan, as opposed to that, as you all knew, knew uh, Judaism is destined for eternity. The Jewish people is an organic body with an urge, and this is original Kaplan, with an urge to self-perpetuation. Kaplan so abhorred the notion that the Jewish people will eventually be dissolved in humanity, that I mean, as this is my, my guess, he temporarily even, you know, is unable to grasp the function of an ideal, for an ideal, both in Cohen's thought and in idealistic philo philosophy in general, um, um, is in fact introduced to be continually approached, but never to be reached, okay? For this is its, its, its very nature, the very nature of an ideal is that it never turns into reality. You know, but besides this rather theoretical point, Kaplan is certainly right in identifying here a major difference between himself and Cohn, at least in method and approach. Cohn approached Judaism as a philosophy, as a school of thought, and the Jewish people as a mere vessel of the abstract ideas of the Jewish religion. Kaplan, by contrast, saw the existence of the Jewish people as an integral part of Judaism not only as a you know, em empirical representation. For this purpose, he finds a very clear, although very uh, philosophical metaphor, and we heard about this this morning. This is the metaphor of the difference between body and mind, between body and matter, you know, in, in, in your words. For Cohen, the idealistic philosopher, both are separable realities. For Kaplan, body and mind are two aspects of the same reality. The same is true for the Jewish people, and Judaism, for Kaplan, the Jewish people, is not the vessel of Jewish thought, but, I quote, intrinsic to and inseparable from the substance of the Jewish religion itself, unquote. And to this, um, <laughs> it is certainly true, Cohen would never have agreed, never in a whole life, okay? <laughs> Applied to more, more practical terms, this fundamental difference 
uh, can be demonstrated by the notion of Jewish singularity, by the uniqueness of Judaism. If Kuhn was right, Kaplan claims correctly, then the basic ideas of Judaism, just as I mentioned, Messianism, monotheism, were transferable to other nations. In Kohn's case, first and foremost, of course, from the Jewish people to the German people, which seems to be especially suspicious in Kaplan's eyes. You know? uh, he himself rather believed that for each religion, holiness means something different. And we have heard this before today. Namely, exactly that which enables its members best to make the most of life. Holiness for Kaplan is that which enables the member of a certain religion to make the best of life. S ethically, he adds, ethically and spirituality. Spiritually. 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 You know, without being able to, to go into this, I think this is a problematic theory, but just think about, you know, Islam being the best for the Arabs to make the best of life ethically and spirituality. Spiritually. Spiritually, you know. That would follow from this uh, theory, in my guess. And we also talked about this uh, earlier today, so this is kind of problematic. It might be true for Judaism, but, you know, as soon as you take this out of the Jewish context, uh, it becomes a kind of problematic theory. To make this point clearer, we can take what we by now have identified as the most fundamental difference between Cohn and Kaplan from Kaplan's introduction to the book on Cohn to the actual commentary itself that Kaplan wrote on Cohn's book, Religion of Reason. Here the same problem, that of the purpose and meaning of Jewish existence, is discussed with reference to the past and not to the future of Judaism. In his commentary, Kaplan took up Cohn's original question as to why Judaism survived for thousands of years. Cohn's answer is essentially the same that was given from the beginning of modern Jewish thought that was given by Mendelssohn um, at the very beginning. And this answer is, the Jewish idea of monotheism requires, and I quote from Kohn now, a continuous development beyond the Bible, which could not be entrusted to those people who did not produce the Bible. The continu continuity of the spiritual power of one people was necessary in this case, unquote. The Jewish people as a nation was for Cohen a symbol, a symbol of the desired unity of mankind. The Greeks, for example, with all their cultural achievements, could not be the symbol because they simply had no idea of mankind in the first place. The Greeks, the Greeks did not know at all what, what, what it means, uh, a unified mankind. This concept was intrinsically bound to monotheism for Cohen. The one God arose in one people. Kaplan, as opposed to that, did not think that Judaism had, above all, a religious mission to the world, providing it with monotheism as a unique idea that will eventually bring peace, culture, and morality to all humankind. Kaplan identified Judaism's purpose as being particularly Jewish. For Kaplan, the Jewish religion's function was to intensify this, the collective self-consciousness of the Jewish people. It fostered, I quote him, have you heard this many times before, an awareness of the past to be proud of and the future to look forward to. That is, after all, an awareness of belonging to a people which has the nicest hopes for its own future, as Kaplan writes in the book on Cohen. Um, for Kaplan, the essence of Greek art, Greek art, poetry, and philosophy was indeed transferable and indeed transferred to other nations, whereas Jewish self-consciousness was not. A people who had such a self-consciousness as the Jews intends to live eternally. For Kohn, once monotheism rules universally, there will be no need for Israel anymore. That means, Kaplan explains, that for Kohn, Jewish nationhood, or as we heard, Jewish peoplehood, is at best a necessary evil at the present time. Whereas for Kaplan himself, Jewish nationhood is at all times indispensable to the normal development of human nature. At this point, you know, the philosophical difference between uh, both thinkers could not be clearer, I think. Um, Kaplan chose a telling example for this claim. Nationhood for him is the same, I quote again, like family life and other natural, other, other types of natural groupings. And of quote, which in, 
you know, from my point of view, brings him very close to uh, what uh, Franz Rosenzweig uh, called the Gemeinschaft des Blutes, uh, the community of blood, um, as a you know, present guarantee for the hope in the future. But still, interestingly, Kaplan is very much aware of the dangers of such a bloodline approach to nationhood. And unlike Rosenzweig, Kaplan writes all this, of course, after the Holocaust, after the Shoah, so that he immediately adds to his naturalist theory of nation the following almost abrogating condition. It is valid only if, I quote, freed from the spirit of exclusivism, totalitarianism, and absolutism. End of quote. Hermann Cohn, by contrast, did not see Jewish nationhood as a family business. For him, the Jews were a cultural community bound and formed by law. Bound and formed by law. It's a Kantian, of course. Practically keeping Torah law guaranteed for a social, for, for, excuse me, practically keeping Torah law guaranteed for a certain cultural isolation of the Jews in their nationality, which is indispensable for the preservation of the Jewish religion and thus for the preservation of pure Jewish monotheism. In summary, for Kaplan, as for Rosenzweig, the perpetuation of the Jewish nation is a value in itself. We discussed this a lot. This is what I read uh, uh, in Kaplan. It needs no explanation. For Kohn, however, Jewish survival needs to serve a purpose outside of Judaism itself, because Jews and Jewish history are not beyond the cultural development of the world. They are not meta-history, as in Rosenzweig. For Kaplan, religion is basically a social phenomenon. For Cohen, um, religion is you know, a very special part of the unity of the human consciousness, as he called it, other parts being logic, ethics, aesthetics, you know, as you know. Kaplan is interested in Judaism as a civilization, where religion is only a certain part of Judaism, while Cohen is interested in the universal philosophical ideas Judaism developed and pursued. Now, this can certainly be seen as a legitimate methodological difference. The interesting question here is rather, and we referred this question also yesterday, um, which is you know, my privilege to <laughs> speak all, you know, uh, on the second day. The interesting question is rather, which approach is more helpful for living Judaism to find a way through the jungle of the modern world? You know, is it the question why we need to survive or how we need to survive? And I think the answer is still pending. Before uh, my friend Catherine Madsen takes the mic, a quick reminder about questions, uh, note cards, email, text, Twitter. I'm thrilled to report there are literally hundreds of people who've checked into our online broadcast, and I'm encouraging them um, in saying that to submit questions as well. Thanks. First of all, an aside to Randy, uh, if you want to hear about God possibly being wrong, come to Amherst. <laughs> we talk about things like that there. The Jewish community of Amherst welcomes you. <laughs> Mel Skult tells a story in his new book, The Radical American Judaism of Mordechai Kaplan, about a rabbi at the JTS who always asked him in the cafeteria, why did Kaplan talk about Judaism as a civilization? The Eskimos have a civilization. Kaplan should have understood that what was distinctive about Jews was their culture. Civilization has to do with knives and forks. The Eskimos do have a civilization, and anybody who thinks it has mainly to do with artifacts and folkways should investigate its moral, moral structure. Civilization has to do with civilizing people. Jewish culture is arts and letters, and music, and movies, and food. Jewish civilization is Torah and mitzvot, tzedakah and chesed, the whole corpus of moral instruction of which Hitler complained that the Jews gave the world conscience. Why did Kaplan talk about Judaism as a civilization? Because he recognized conscience, because he wanted Judaism to survive as an agile, responsive, responsible way of life. In his 1958 book, Judaism Without Supernaturalism, Kaplan asked, what constitutes maturity for American Jewry? I'm not sure we'll find the answer, or even the question, coherently expressed in any faction of contemporary American Jewry, liberal or orthodox. 
I think we may find it in the, French philosoph the work of the French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, who reconstructed Judaism in a very different sense than Kaplan's, and the focus of whose work was what he called the essential insatiability of the conscience, and who not incidentally once wrote an essay called A Religion for Adults. Neither Kaplan nor Levinas knew of the other's work, or at least there's no evidence I've seen, but interesting resemblances appear in their thinking and in their backgrounds. Both were Litvaks. They were born a generation apart, Kaplan in 1881 and Levinas in 1905. Kaplan was one generation removed from Kovno, where his father had studied in yeshiva, and Levinas was born in Kovno. So they both grew up with the strong influence of the Musar movement, the 19th century pietist movement centered on introspection and moral growth. They were both grounded in Jewish thought and committed to largely orthodox practice, but both had allegiances outside the Jewish framework as well, Kaplan to sociology and Levinas to philosophy. They are both decisively modern thinkers, willing to speak of God in ways that can be taken for secular. They were both to some extent outsiders in their professions. Kaplan's rationalism alienated many of his JTS colleagues, and Levinas as a non-Marxist was shut out of academia in France till his reputation in philosophy was very well established. Neither is an easy read. If Kaplan is often turgid in the, in the manner of John Dewey, Levinas is often completely impenetrable. <laughs> they both nevertheless have epigrammatic flashes that make permanent changes in one's thinking. Kaplan's a vote, not a veto. Levinas's duties become greater in the measure that they are accomplished. The differences between Kaplan and Levinas are partly generational and partly geographical. Whereas Kaplan came very young to an America where assimilation was the major threat to Jewish life and tried to create a Judaism that could survive safety and freedom, Levinas moved to France to study with phenomenologists Edmund Husserl and Martin Heidegger and saw Jewish life in Europe attacked with appalling force. As an officer in the French army, he spent the war years doing forced labor in a German prison camp. His wife and young daughter were hidden in a convent. His parents and his two brothers were shot in Kovna. After the war, he became principal of a Jewish teacher's college in Paris, where most of his students were Moroccan and Mizrahi Jews. Whereas Kaplan reconstructed Judaism through a sociological and theological schema to salvage it for immigrants who might otherwise abandon it, Levinas rebuilt Jewish life in a more basic and literal sense in a devastated Europe. For him, there could be no question of abandoning Judaism or doubting its relevance to modern life. Through his experience of slavery and jeopardy, even his subsequent experience of safety and freedom was intensified, rendered urgent. He knew that emergency is a permanent feature of the human condition. If we compare Kaplan's conceptual framework with Levinas's, it's not surprising that we find certain points of tension. Kaplan's approach was essentially functional, as we've been hearing for a day and a half already. Religion is good for us as a form of belonging, even when it leaves us cold in terms of believing. Levinas isn't concerned with what's good for us, but with what we are good for. Ask not what your religion can do for you. Levinas was suspicious of sociology and also of politics for their generality, because they reduced complex human beings to categories, or as he said, to elements of an ideal calculus. For Levinas, we are always individuals with direct obligations to other individuals. All ethics and all obligation begin with what we see in the face of the other person. Kaplan was a functionalist not only in his, review, in his view of religious community, but in his view of God. He rejected the supernatural and described God in abstract terms as the power that makes for salvation or the God idea. Levinas, in his philosophical writings, generally avoids speaking of God, but he sometimes uses the deliberately cryptic term the trace, meaning the trace of transcendence that enters the daily world through acts of goodness. If Kaplan distances himself from the traditional God, in Levinas, the trace is distant from us, elusive and haunting. We can't even claim it as evidence of God's existence. Theologizing it is an evasion of doing its work. Kaplan insisted on using the word salvation to mean something like self-actualization. Every time I see him do this, I think of Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty saying, who's to be master? You are the word. 
But uh, Kaplan did think that self-actualization wasn't simply a matter of following your bliss, but was bound up with service to others. And so far, that's quite compatible with Levinas. But Levinas isn't interested in how to be saved. In his philosophical framework, the self can only be concerned with the other's salvation in the original sense of rescue, deliverance. You have to feed the other, provide for the other, respond to the other. Levinas speaks of being torn up from oneself in the core of one's unity by the infinite series of assaults of other realities and other needs on one's own, a process in which we have neither a vote nor a veto. The self's act actualization comes about only through the answer, Hineni, here I am, to the summons of the other. Returning to their similarities, both Kaplan and Levinas have been accused of reducing Judaism to ethics. I think this is a misunderstanding not only of Kaplan and Levinas, but of ethics, which is not a reduction, but an enactment of Jewish imperatives. Actually, there is a tendency among American Jews to reduce Judaism to ethics in a casual and complacent way as a set of attitudes. Yehuda Mirsky recently lampooned it as the reduction of ethics to the editorial page of the New York Times. But this is not what either Kaplan or Levinas is up to. Some of Kaplan's most interesting statements explore the persistence and uncanniness of the ethical impulse in a world where rationalism might have explained it away. In a 1905 journal entry, Kaplan said, quote, thought establishes beyond dispute that our notions of right and wrong have arisen from convenience, custom, etc. There is no room in pure logic for the ought, but the ought is there anyhow, and a mighty stubborn and positive thing it is, end quote. In The Religion of Ethical Nationhood, 1970, he wrote, quote, neither through mysticism nor reason, but through the emotional experience of responsibility can we become aware of God's existence as the power that assures man's fulfillment and survival, end quote. A passage from The Meaning of God in Modern Jewish Religion, 1936, is worth quoting at some length, both for its presentation of Kaplan's position and for its anticipation of Levinas, quote, the purpose in the various attempts to reinterpret the God idea is not to dissolve the God idea into ethics. It is to identify those experiences which should represent for us the actual working of what we understand by the conception of God. Man's ethical aspirations are part of a cosmic urge by obeying which man makes himself at home in the universe. Without the emotional intuition of an inner harmony between human nature and universal nature, without the conviction born of the heart rather than of the mind that the world contains all that is necessary for human salvation. The assumptions necessary for ethical living remain cold hypotheses lacking all dynamic power. They are like an engine with all the parts intact and assembled, but lacking the fuel which alone can set it in operation. The dynamic of ethical action is the spirit of worship, the feeling that we are in God and God in us, the yielding of our persons in voluntary surrender to those larger aims that express for us as much as has been revealed to us of the destiny of the human race. It is only this emotional reaction to life that can make humanity itself mean more to us than a disease of the agglutinated dust." End quote. We may note here Kaplan's stylistic debts to Whitman, Matthew Arnold, and Emerson and to Robert Louis Stevenson, who supplied the agglutinated dust, though it must be said that his own prose sometimes lacks a certain spark that might ignite the fuel. <laughs> Levinas will have nothing of the cosmic urge, the inner harmony, the spirit of worship, the being at home in the universe. He gets there faster, more sharply, and with a certain ruthless economy as of a lightning bolt. Here is Levinas on the same subject. Quote, ethics is not the corollary of the vision of God. It is that very vision. Ethics is an optic, such that everything I know of God and everything I can hear of his word and reasonably say to him must find an ethical expression." End quote. Another passage from Levinas in which he insists that the self and the imagination are necessary equipment for ethical action. Quote, Justice summons me to go beyond the straight line of justice, and henceforth nothing can mark the end of this march. Behind the straight line of the law, the land of goodness extends, infinite and unexplored, necessitating all the resources of a singular presence. I am therefore necessary for justice, 
as responsible beyond every limit fixed by an objective law. The I is a privilege and an election. The sole possibility in being of going beyond the straight line of the law, that is, of finding a place lying beyond the universal, is to be I. The morality called inward and subjective exercises a function which universal and objective law cannot exercise, but which it calls for." End quote. This isn't self-actualization. It's being actualized into a whole new self by the demands of an external situation. But we might pause on the word election. Levinas obviously doesn't share Kaplan's aversion to chosenness. Neither does he approach it as a purely Jewish condition. Kaplan considered chosenness merely an antiquated chauvinism, an embarrassment to the Jews and an irritant to the Goyen. Levinas, speaking from what Kaplan called the emotional experience of responsibility, locates a kind of commandment, commandedness that is binding upon everyone, Jew and non-Jew, on everyone who looks into the face of the other. The philosopher Philip Nemo wrote of him that, quote, Levinas devoted all of his spiritual energy, all of his philosophical genius, to providing an entirely universal form to biblical ethics. Levinas never stopped being loyal to Judaism and nourished by the sources of the Bible and the Talmud, but his philosophical efforts consisted of articulating the revelation in such a way that no one can avoid them. He developed the concepts and even the vocabulary of his ethical philosophy in such a way that no one could say, that is good for Jews, that is good for Christians, but that is meaningless to someone who does not believe in these superstitions or who does not belong to this ethnicity for someone who is only human." End quote. Kaplan's rejection of chosenness was meant as a refusal of self-regard and arrogance and was in its way becomingly humble, but he got it backwards, we're all chosen now. If Kaplan established a Judaism that was both rational and ethical, Levinas enables us to take it farther. His language is more precise and his estimate, his estimate of our capacities more bracing. He offers not an accommodation to our social circumstances, but a challenge to our moral stamina. If Kaplan rationalized and demythologized Judaism, Levinas in a sense re-enchants it, not through a return to supernaturalism, but through the recognition, trustworthy in its full strength Litvak sobriety, that feeding the hungry and releasing the bound and raising the bent are the most extraordinary acts we can accomplish. If Kaplan defined Judaism as an evolving civilization, Levinas points the direction in which, if American Judaism really wants maturity, it might aspire to evolve. Thank you. I often argue that it is possible to do serious philosophical presentations that are in uh, accessible, indeed wonderful English, so thank you. That, that was great. Um, so I'll begin the questions. Um, Hermann Cohen may not uh, be of great interest generally, but he's obviously of great interest in this room. <laughs> so uh, first question for, uh, uh, for George. Um, How long did it take, or did Cohen, I'm sorry, let me start again. How long did Cohen think it would take for Judaism and other faiths to dissolve? <laughs> Ballpark <laughs> estimate, I guess. I'm, not, I'm just the reader. <laughs> it, it will take until the Messiah comes, you know. <laughs> that would and be, that will be that, when? <laughs> that would have been his answer, and as we all know, as good Jews, you know, and that, then nobody knows the answer to that question. No, that's a very, I mean, it's, it's beyond the religious context. It's a very philosophical question, which really has to do with the question of, can an ideal ever be reached? And this is one of the major criticisms that were brought forward against the theory of Cohen, that uh, it, this theory would not give the Jewish people the hope you know, because if the ideal could never be reached, because as I said, this is the very nature of the ideal, then there's nothing to hope for. You know, the Messiah will never come. Okay, so um, th there's a whole, you know, difficult theory, you know, how Cohen would answer this question, um, but, but in terms of times, um, uh, 
it could be, it could, you know, it could be phrased in, in years <laughs> or in, in whatever, in millennia or whatever. It, it could only be said that, you know, as soon as, as, you know, mankind is ready, and this is the whole idea of Cohen's messianism, which has a very strong um, root in Jewish thought to say that uh, it's, our, it's our task. You know, it's, it's, it's something that we have actively to do. We have to bring the Messiah. We don't have to wait until God sends them. We have to bring the Messiah, and it takes as long as it takes us to bring uh, this one for Dr. Friedman. Um, for Kaplan, given the combined influence of Dewey and James, might experience ever trump ideals? It's a, it based, I think the question is based on, a, it's a good question, but it, the way that Dewey and Kaplan uh, use the, what, what they mean by ideals is not the traditional philosophical meaning. It actually is no, there is no distance between ideals and reality. Uh, Kaplan defines God as exactly where our ideas become actual through communal action. So it's not that an experience trumps an ideal, it's that an experience is part of the pursuit of an ideal, just as an experience is a reflection of one's habits of belief. And James, in Dewey, an experience is always intimately involved, not uh, in the pursuit of or the creation of ideals like a messianic ideal would be. Another Cohen question for Dr. Kohler. The uh, questioner asks or writes, I think there's a basic min misunderstanding about Cohen. For Cohen, Jewish, I'm going to butcher the German, nationalität, nationalität does not serve the, uh, does not serve the Jewish idea as much as it is the idea that allows us to identify Jewish phenomena, such as a Jewish people. Or rather, it is the idea that organizes Jewish phenomena as such out of a welter of experience. Cohen has this you know, um, idea that nation uh, is something different from nationality. This is how he solves the problem. He says Jews are in nationality within nations. Okay, so, but this is quite necessary. And this is something that we have to keep. And, this, and, and, and the function, you know, to speak in Kaplanian terms, the function is that we have to keep the law, not for the law's sake and not for God's sake, you know, in, in, a ter in terms of a personal law, but we have to keep the law in order to preserve the Jewish nationality. This is Cohen's idea. Because Judaism or Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy is necessary to, uh, because it provides the, the, the most basic, the most fundamental idea, and this is uh, monotheism. Monotheism is at the center of all culture. And this has to be preserved, you know, and, and, and that's why uh, the Jewish nation has to be preserved. So it's, it's a very functional view, actually, <laughs> that Cohen has of Jewish nationality, of Jewish nation. It's, it's only, and, and, and that's why uh, 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 here comes Kaplan's criticism of saying that it is a necessary evil, which is, of course, unfair because, you know, for every true idealistic philosopher as Cohen was, every, uh, uh, every being is an evil compared to the old, okay? So, so it's always evil, you know, the, the reality is evil compared to what there ought to be, okay? Uh, uh, but, but as long as the Messiah didn't come to return to this phrase, um, um, Jewish, nation has, Jewish nationality has to be kept up by keeping the law. This is Cohen's point of view. Uh, for Catherine Madsen, first, thank you for a beautiful paper. That's both in quotation marks and from me. Um, you alluded to the Apostle Paul and universalized election. Uh, it was Paul who called Christians the true Israel. Is Livinas a Jewish philosopher or a Christian philosopher? There are certainly some Christian influences on Levinas. Um, certainly, I think living in France, a Catholic country, and reading Catholic philosophers did filter into his thinking. Um, I'm not sure how consciously, it's hard to tell. Um, in his later thought, there's this whole strain of argument about substitution, um, which I've never found anywhere but in the English poet and critic Charles Williams, um, who was very Anglo-Catholic but also influenced by French Catholic writers. So. You know, it, it's it's not um, it's not absent. It, it's it's certainly 
around the edges and possibly in certain ways working its way inward, but uh, as, as for Messianism, no, he doesn't go that far. For anybody who wants to try uh, an answer, uh, the questioner asks, why is it problematic to apply Kaplan's theory of holiness outside of the context of Judaism, to Islam, for example? Well, uh, Judaism is uh, a particular religion, and um, uh, Jews are holy in a in a in a particular way. And I think that Kaplan helped us understand that uh, in a way that didn't have to do with the chosen people, but nonetheless had to do with being Jewish. Uh, I mean, the nature of what he called the sancta and and his functionalism, as we've referred to it over the last couple of days, uh, might very well apply to holiness as conceived by, by Islam or by other religions. But it's, it's not an easy transition, uh, because I think that Kaplan, um, in his, uh, even his philosophical orientation toward basic Jewish concepts, was very Jewish. Because that was actually my claim, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I'm a theologian, and I see, you know, if, if there is only one God, and this one God says, you know, be holy because I am holy, then he, he or it or whatever the idea is, says it to everybody, to the Arabs, to the Jews, to, to Christians, of course. So there, there couldn't be a different ethics for Muslims and Christians and Jews. There's only one ethics. There might be, might, might be different ways of serving God, of rituals or whatever, but there's only one ethics, and this ethics is universal. I mean, this is, I'm talking now as a Kohenian, okay? But, so, but this is the answer. So that's why it's problematic, and that's why I said it, that uh, if, if Kaplan says Judaism is good for Jews, because holiness is in Judaism something different than holiness would be outside of Judaism, as for example in Islam, I'm you know, confronting this by saying, if there's one God and he says, be holy because I am holy, then there's only one holiness possible. Great. So also for Catherine Madsen, uh, unlike Cohen, Levinas seems all the rage among educated Jews in the pews and has been for some time. Um, is it your sense that they're, under, that they're re actually reading Levinas or are they just hanging on to a few key slogans, notably about the centrality of the other? You know, I don't know because I don't really know any Jews in the pews who are reading Levinas. Well, talking uh, about Levinas, you know, anyway. Th yeah. th that yeah. I haven't told them. Right. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, his name is thrown around occasionally, and uh, he's, he's not easy to read, and it is hard to tell sometimes whether people have gotten beyond that, that aspect of him. Do you have a recommendation as to whether, for those who can read French, it's easier in the French? Or in uh, the English? I'm told it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's the philosophical, uh, it's the way philosophers have to talk to each other to prove that they're, to prove that they're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Others think we'll get back on schedule. Um, Eliezer Berkowitz has to be brought in. Um, so I'll, this is from me. Um, at the last uh, Kaplan conference at Stanford, uh, that Miriam Rowland played a major role in, in making possible 10 years ago. Uh, I asked this question, which is whether anybody here knew of a, a, um, uh, an effective refutation or even an attempted serious refutation of Berkowitz's famous claim that Kaplan's transnaturalism was a disguised form of supernaturalism. So I'll ask, they couldn't answer, nobody had an answer to the question, so I'll ask. Yeah, besides saying that's wrong. <laughs> is it? I mean, it, it, Why is it wrong? Because he's never interested in an experience of something that is predicated on the prior being of the object of experience. That's it's a critical difference between James and how some, uh, some people read James and Dewey, but it's Kaplan is never having an experience of. I mean, there was a discussion uh, yesterday about uh, the role of uh, Rudolf Otto in Kaplan's thought. But Kaplan is never saying that we as individuals have an experience of a pre-existing causal force, God. That's, I mean, this is the opening of uh, Judaism without supernaturalism. Is you know, it's like, look, we can't, we can't believe this anymore. So it's, it's not hidden at all. It's actually quite 
overt and explicit in most of his writings, especially in Judaism without, Judaism without Supernaturalism, perhaps just in the title he makes it as explicit as possible. His claim, yes, certainly. Okay. Catherine, you want to? Um, as long as we're on the subject of who's actually reading Levinas, I want to put in a plug for a book. It's, it's not written yet. It's a work in progress by my friend Mara Benjamin at St. Olaf College. Um, she is working with Levinas' concept of the other and Sarah Ruddick and other feminist philosophers' concept of maternal thinking. Um, she's bringing up two young kids with her partner, and uh, she's been thinking about all of these things. And the combination promises to be extremely interesting. So watch for this in a few years. Um, I, I think uh, it needs to be said, and I'm using a, 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 a term from French philosophy, especially Derrida, but uh, that there is a trace of supernaturalism in Kaplan. And it couldn't be otherwise. I mean, um, uh, we reconstructionists uh, even um, come out of the Jewish tradition. And so uh, our vocabulary and our thinking, no matter how naturalistic it becomes, and I'm thinking especially of the liturgy here, uh, maintains a trace of supernaturalism. That's not to say that it's supernatural. And I think that that trace has been insufficiently examined as a trace. It's not a contradiction. It's a trace that remains part of who we are. And that can be thought and discussed without being defensive and without um, uh, exposing it as a contradiction because it's not. I mean, it's part of the tradition that we inherit. And Kaplan's religious naturalism maintains its integrity despite that, that trace of supernaturalism. And maybe even the trace of supernaturalism makes Kaplan's particular or peculiar religious naturalism possible. Uh, oh, great. Well, we're out of time. Thank you again uh, very much. So we're going to take a 10-minute break.